We're here today to talk about uh, quality of life surgery uh, for metastatic disease to the spine. I'm Chris Stein from McMaster University in Canada. And I'm Christina Goldstein from the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. Um, over the last few years, all of us have struggled with, uh, with this issue with the metastatic disease because people are living longer and longer due to the great uh, treatment options that's available nowadays. I find that I, I, it's very hard to talk to these patients because you always have to give them an idea of what can you actually offer them. And I've evolved to the point where I always say to them three things. I said, I'm not going to cure your cancer or even try and prolong your life, but I'm going to try and make it better while you still live. Um, in, a, in a way to try and manage ex this, uh, their expectations. How do you manage expectations of these patients, uh, Christina? So that's absolutely a good point. Um, some of the things I look at with them is ask them what's important to them um, in terms of their remaining life expectancy. I uh, try and ask them if they've been given any information from their oncologist regarding how long um, they may have left to live um, and then determine what their primary symptoms are Sometimes these patients will present to us with uh, issues related to back pain, um, and that's what's limiting their functional ability. Sometimes they'll present emergently with um, spinal cord or compromise or neurologic deficits, and in that case, then um, maintaining or getting back uh, their ability to ambulate is uh, of utmost importance to them. So trying to find out what their goals are for their remaining uh, life is important, and then explaining to them that um, I'm trying to help them with those uh, symptoms is uh, really what I'm, uh, my goals are for surgical intervention. I think those are really important points. So we're trying to really address specific symptoms rather than whatever we perceive to be uh, what can be done out of a spinal surgery point of view. There's many decision-making um, uh, aids out there that want to try and predict which patients would get unstable, which of these patients need stabilization, which do not. Um, how much do you find that you use them in, in this subset of population? If, if we say that we're talking about a patient that might have less than six months to live, do you think they're very useful or do you use any of them? So I think the spinal instability uh, neoplasm score is uh, useful in terms of looking at the um, involvement of the spinal column. Um, but in terms of my decision making for surgery, uh, it's more important to me to potentially use the NOMS criteria, looking at the type of neoplasm that you have, um, what's the uh, oncology, and then um, looking at whether or not the cancer is um, resistant to radiation or is amenable to radiation. And then what's the patient's um, functional status in terms of something like the Karnofsky score, are they able to ambulate? And then also just my general gestalt about them. When I look at them, do they look like uh, a sick patient or do they otherwise look fairly healthy? Are they malnourished? Are they cachectic? Do they look like somebody who's gonna be able to make it through the operation that I'm proposing to them um, and heal the wound in particular? Because when you then start to talk to them about adjuvant radiation therapy, if that's gonna be playing a role, then um, wound healing is definitely something that I'm worried about. Yeah, I find that difficult. That's another thing that I find is quite a problem because these patients often end up seeing me uh, after they've had recently had radiation and now they've done, uh, developed a, a, a number of symptoms. And uh, th there's a fair amount of evidence out there lately on what the effects of radiation on healing is, but I found it hard to, 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 to make up my own mind um, looking at this evidence. How long should you wait after radiation if you can delay it to do surgery? Should you do a big operation versus a small operation in these patients? Should it change your surgical um, uh, uh, management of these cases? And there's actually very little out there that would, would guide you in this, at least what I could find in the literature. Uh, we've gone more to a minimally invasive approach in these patients, which sometimes violate the original principles of stabilization a little bit because we don't always go to the anterior uh, column. We sometimes mm -hmm. just do posterior fixation. I don't know if you have any experience with that because it's something that, has, that, that we've really thought about and, and really haven't got a good evidence base to, to guide us on. Mm -hmm. I don't have much experience using uh, minimally invasive uh, procedures for um, local debulking of uh, tumors, but certainly um, I think there is some evidence to support percutaneous stabilization with um, 
uh, vertebroplasty in the setting of metastatic disease where there wouldn't be epidural involvement because of the risk of creating neurologic injury. Um, and certainly there has been some evidence um, out of Toronto to suggest that um, vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty in the setting of uh, neoplasm does not interfere with the effects of um, uh, serotactic body radiation therapy. Um, and we do know that uh, SBRT does increase the risk of um, fracture uh, in the setting of, uh, of oncology and tumor. Um, for me, with uh, radiation and wounds, um, if patient's going to be having SBRT, so more localized radiation, I think waiting two weeks for uh, their wound to heal is appropriate. For conventional radiation therapy, I tend to wait a little bit longer, usually around four weeks, um, but that also depends on whether they're getting chemotherapy and also on the severity of their disease. So um, I'm willing to let them go sooner for their radiation therapy and deal with the wound complications if necessary. Yeah. Have you got any tips? Uh, I, I pick your brain or do you have any tips of dealing with those wound complications? If, if you get that wound that doesn't want to heal, you've done the decompression now because patient had epidural disease and was going neurologically backwards right after radiation, um, then the wound deesis. How, how do you manage that, Christina? So I think in patients who, who may be at risk, who um, have uh, less subcutaneous tissue and uh, or who have previously had radi radiation therapy, um, using a, um, an incisional vac right off the um, bat, right off the bat might be something that you could consider doing. Um, in patients who have issues with dehiscence, then dressing changes uh, with uh, good nursing care are appropriate. Making sure you're using non-absorbable sutures that can stay um, longer than, uh, than absorbable ones is also very important. Maybe supplementing with staples as needed and uh, if need be. And some of these patients, I've even had them um, need to go on to um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy to try and get these wounds to heal. Of course, that's something you wanna try and avoid um, because these patients only have certain amounts of life expectancy. So trying to put them through that is, uh, is gonna interfere with their quality of life. This, these cases, I, I, I agree, it's, um, it's the kind of cases that if you're going to take this on, I think you need to be prepared to be in it for the long term, mm -hmm. basically for the patient's life, because they tend to keep on coming back. So another thing that we uh, have wondered about is, do you need to chase fusion in these patients? In other words, when you do the initial surgery, would you even worry about putting bone graft down, preparing for bone graft? Doesn't it just introduce extra uh, um, um, uh, foreign matter into the wound that could complicate things down the line. We have stopped doing that in our practice. There's one or two studies out that supports that if the patient has less than six months realistically uh, of life expectation. Um, there's no good evidence uh, for that, but mm -hmm. we feel that sta stability is the most important thing and we can ch achieve that with cement augmented screws and yep. uh, kyphoplasties. And, um, and we don't have to uh, add uh, any 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 time to the procedure or any other uh, um, biologics to try and make a fusion happen. How do you do you would, would you agree with that, or is that something that you? Yeah, absolutely. During uh, my training and uh, and practice now, whenever I have patients with metastatic disease, I feel that the instrumentation uh, in and of itself is appropriate. Um, I don't put down additional bone graft um, because it's. Um, non-viable and then the radiation therapy is going to contribute to that so um, in general I'm not going for fusion in these patients um, I may consider drilling out the facet joints um, and see if that ends up going on to fusion but that's not necessarily my goal um, and also in terms of anterior column reconstruction if I do uh, debulking of the anterior column, my go-to reconstruction for these patients is typically um, cement as opposed to any type of um, bone substitute. Yeah, I, I, these uh, patients, the, the take-home point on that is probably that with a limited life expectancy, the smaller procedure you can do, the better for the patient in the long run because the last thing that I feel I want to do to a patient is make him spend a long time in hospital mm -hmm. because of the procedure yeah. when he's got limited time with his family. Um, and then finally, do you follow these patients up? If they're doing well, do you allow them to come, do, do they, you want them to come back and see you on a regular basis or do you just see them for a few weeks after surgery and they'd say, well, come back if you have a problem? So that's typically what I do. I like to see them until their wound is healed. 
um, just to make sure that there's no issues with that. Although if they're having problems, they usually know where to find me. Um, and then once um, that's the case, I don't think that bringing them back for ongoing radiographic follow-up is necessary. As uh, you said, we are trying to improve their quality of life and coming back into my clinic and having to wait to see me really doesn't add much to that quality. So um, I would prefer that they just call me if they're having any problems. No, I agree with that. As academics, we always want to see our patients again, but these patients definitely have better things to do than see us.